Now, up until this moment, everything that we talked about in this course have been describing macroscopic views. So a lot of the chemistry that we've been talking about is the chemistry that we can see, all right? But there's the other side, which is actually the second half of the course, where we're looking at the chemistry that we can't see, the microscopic, okay? So we have these two worlds of chemistry, the macroscopic view that we can see and the microscopic view that we can't. There's got to be a way to relate the macroscopic view to the microscopic view. And there is. So uh, in the 1860s, a series of scientists were able to start piecing together the relationship or the linkage between these two worlds. Okay, And the way they did that was to describe the physical characteristics of gases in terms of the individual molecules. And not only the individual molecules themselves, but the motions of the molecules. And they did this based on the definition of kinetic energy. So let's get that down. All right, so kinetic energy is the energy of movement. And so... Okay, so that's what kinetic energy is. If gases are moving, that means they have kinetic energy. All right, so that was the that was the first conclusion that the scientists, the group of scientists in the 1860s made, that if gas molecules and atoms are moving, then that means that they have to have kinetic energy. And so there was a series of, of people, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann and James Clerk Maxwell. We're going to hear about Maxwell in a little bit in Chapter 8 uh, when we start talking about quantum theory. So we'll talk about him again. Boltzmann, if you go on to Gen Chem 2, you'll talk about him because he's actually, a, he plays a big role in the development of thermodynamics, which is actually the next unit coming up. So, and then there's uh, another guy named uh, Gibbs, Josiah Gibbs, who also worked on this. He, uh, we'll talk about him at the very end of thermodynamics in the next unit, but in Gen Chem 2, we really talk about him a lot. So, Group of scientists came together in the 1860s and made several generalizations about gases. Now, over the over the years, with the these theories, these generalizations picked up the name the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Just like atomic theory, some of these have modified since the 1860s, but this pretty much still holds up true today. There are some modifications that we're going to have to address, and we'll do so now. Now, there's five postulates or parts to this theory. So what we're going to do is start step by step and explain. All right. So the first postulate goes like this. Gases are composed of molecules whose size is negligible compared to the average distance between them. All right. So gases are composed of molecules whose size is negligible compared to the average distance between them. So in other words, what this is saying is that let's say you have two gas atoms. You could have a big atom of argon, and you can have a little atom of hydrogen, all right? It doesn't matter how big the atom is. It doesn't matter how small the atom is. The size has no bearing on, on the... Size has no bearing as to, uh, you know, what's going on. But the biggest thing here is the distance. The, so the size doesn't matter. It's the distance between the molecules that matters. So size doesn't matter to gases. Only the distance between the particles matter. And the reason for that is actually postulate number two. Molecules, gases, move in random 
straight lines in all directions and at various speeds. So gases move randomly. in straight lines in all directions and at various speeds. So in other words, we can't control where gases are going to go. So they're going to move in random straight lines at various speeds there's no rhyme or reason. They just go. All right, step three. Step three says this. The intermolecular forces between gas particles are very weak or negligible, except when they collide. So now, uh, let's, let's start writing. So now we got this phrase, intermolecular forces. All right, now intermolecular forces that we're talking about attraction, we're talking about repulsion. All right, and this is actually the, the this is a topic that we're going to talk about at the very end of the course. But when we're talking about intermolecular forces, we're talking about you know what brings individual molecules together, what repels them. All right, so the intermolecular forces between gas particles. are very weak or negligible, except when they collide. Okay, now when they do collide, The collisions are elastic. All right, so these last two postulates kind of go hand in hand together. So what I'm saying is that if you've got, if you got two atoms and they collide with each other, they bounce off of each other. Okay, so here's where it gets a little tricky. What kinetic molecular theory says is this. If let's say you have a sodium ion and you have a chloride ion, okay, and they collide. Now we know that sodium chloride is a thing. All right, so we know that that is a compound that does form when these two collide. There is attraction. There is repulsion. Uh, there is a there is attraction between these two these two molecules. And if they get super super close, then they, they will repel. But anyhow. So we know that there's attraction here. So what kinetic molecular theory is saying is that when these collide, they bounce off of each other. They're not going to form this compound because they collide, they bounce. And so that's part, that's the part of this theory that we go, well, that's not exactly true because we do know that, yes, this compound can form. We know that can form and it does form. And we know it does form in the gaseous ions. When the gaseous ions come together, they can form that compound. So that's part. That's the part where we get a little little leery about because that's not exactly true. There is some intermolecular forces between the particles. All right. Fi final uh, postulate here it says this: that the average kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. All right, so how does this work? Okay, so basically, if the kinetic energy is going up, then the average temperature of the particles also has to be going up. So there's a relationship here, and the relationship turns out that the kinetic energy is going to be equal to 3 halves times the number of moles times R times T. So that way, as temperature is going up, the kinetic energy is going up. 
Now, kinetic energy, uh, kinetic molecular theory can also explain the, how fast molecules are going in and talks about molecular speed. So let's take a look at two different scenarios. Here's one scenario where we're studying a gas, in this case, nitrogen gas at three different temperatures. So we're looking at three different curves, one at 100 K, one at 300 K, and another one at 700 K. Now, what it looks like what's going on is that the shapes of the curves are different. So one, the one at 100 K seems to be very, very pointed. And then as the curve, as the temperatures increase, the curves kind of spread out. But one, one other thing that we're noticing is that if we look at the maxima points on these curves, they are definitely increasing. So as the speeds increase, so do their, so do the average speed of the molecules. Okay, so it looks like as the temperature goes up, you're gonna have a you're gonna have molecules with a wide variety of speeds. So whereas at 100k, a lot of the molecules are gonna have relatively same speeds. At 700k, there's gonna be a wide difference in speeds. So the average, while the average increases, you're going to have wide distribution. Now, here's another thing. Let's say we keep the temperature column, uh, constant this time, but we change the identity of the gases. So we're looking at three gases. You've got chlorine gas on, at the top, nitrogen gas, and then finally helium. So what we're seeing here is that as the gas be, loses mass, so as we're dealing with gases with lower molecular weights, you're going to have wider distributions of speeds, but also their average speeds will increase as well. Okay, so the slow, the the less their molecular weight, the molecular weight of the gas, the higher your ga the gas will go, the faster the gas will go. Okay, now we can also relate mathematically the temperature of a gas to its average speed. So the way that we do this is we collect, uh, we calculate something called the root mean square speed or RMS speed. So we can, we can calculate this using the equation that the RMS speed or the RMS velocity, and that's what this V is, are uh, the root mean square, uh, the root mean square velocity is going to be equal to the square root of three RT divided by the molecular weight. All right, so there's actually a way that we can calculate or actually derive this equation. It's actually pretty cool. Let me let me show you real fast. So the way that we derive, derive this, keep in mind that the kinetic energy is equal to one half times mv squared. All right, and we already know that the molecular, that the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature is given in this equation, three halves R nRT, okay? So if I say, if I set these two equations equal to each other, so remember you have this, three halves, three halves nRT, okay? If I set these equations equal to each other, so one half mv squared is equal to three halves nRT, okay? Now, by definition, in order to get the mass of something, we have to take the number of moles, n, and multiply it by the molecular weight, okay? Which I'm going to shorthand the molecular weight as a capital M with uh, two tails on it. So that way, this is going to be the molecular weight. So if we want to calculate m, the mass, we take the molecular weight, multiply it by n. All right, so we've got m over here. So if I rewrite this term on the left-hand side, using this equation that we've got, m, the mass is equal to the number of moles times the molecular weight. Okay, so I'm going to replace m with n times the molecular weight times b squared. This is equal to 3 halves nRT. All right, so... What we're going to do now is divide both sides so that so that way we're left with velocity. So if I divide this by uh, one half n times the molecular weight, okay, we get this. Now here's what's cool: the 
uh, we've got the three halves divided by one half. The twos will actually cancel each other out. So you're going to be left with three. So that's pretty cool. Okay. And I forgot the left-hand side cancels out. So you're going to be left with three. Now the ends will also cancel out. So that's pretty cool too. So you're going to get three times RT over the molecular weight. All right, so here's what we've got. We've got V squared is equal to 3RT over the molecular weight. Now, if I get V, I need to take the square root, so that way I get V by itself. So this becomes the square root of 3RT over the molecular weight. And so that's how we get that equation. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Now, are you going to be tested on how we derive that equation? Absolutely not. I just want to show you that it's possible that we can derive this equation based on what we know from.